You are up next, my friend. A stroke-like attack would leave our next speaker a quadriplegic mute. He is bedridden, and for many that would mean a much smaller and more confined world, but not for him. He has expanded his world via telepresence. I introduce to you Henry Evans. My name is Henry Evans. I am a mute quadriplegic speaking to you from my bed in Northern California. I had a stroke 12 years ago, which is why I sound like R2D2. Before I begin my remarks, let me just say that my wife Jane and I grew up in St. Louis, and I want to give a shout out to the Dismex Pardons, the Visitation Favettes, and the St. Louis Cardinals. And since it's been years since I have been back, I must say, I love what you have done with the place. About a year ago, I gave a TED talk with Dr. Chev Jenkins of Brown University called Robots for Humanity in which we described how technology helps everyone overcome the disabilities that evolution left us with. For example, neither you nor I can fly like a bird, so we both use assistive devices called airplanes. And using assistive devices doesn't make either of us less human. We also mentioned that robotic technologies, like our camera drone from the Parrot Corporation shown here, can be used to expand the worlds of bedridden and disabled people all over the planet by enabling them to move about independently. Today I will expand on that concept, and describe how five different robotic technologies can be used to allow the disabled or bedridden to experience the world again. But before I do that, let me offer a little perspective. As a native Missourian famously observed, if history doesn't repeat itself, it frequently rhymes. That is certainly true of the history of technological and social change in America. Think back 100 years. Technological advances, like the airplane and the automobile, were rapidly changing our perceptions of time and space, and helped to unleash the potential of the immigrants who were flocking to our shores. And on a side of note, 100 years ago, my stroke would have healed me. Now fast forward a century. Modern medicine has saved my life. New technologies are once again changing our perception of space and time. This time it is the disabled like me, the elderly, and those people who are otherwise unable to travel who are benefiting from technological breakthroughs, as we are once again being given the opportunity to participate in mainstream society. By virtue of remote presence devices I was recently able to effortlessly travel all over the world while I was lying in bed. This represents both a remarkable technological achievement and a significant leveling of the social playing field for bedridden people. Let me introduce the first type of device by describing how I happened upon it as a direct result of our last TED talk. Shortly after it was published, we were asked to speak to members of the US House of Representatives. I was driving the road not around the hotel in Maryland when it occurred to me that I could just as easily be driving through the Smithsonian Institution, or any other museum in the world for that matter. Now, I am old enough to realize that if my ideas are any good, someone else has already thought of them. So I googled museum robots, and happily learned that they were indeed being experimented with at the National Museum of Australia, the Tech Museum in London, and the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley. I decided to throw my weight behind their efforts. The result is a tele-tour of famous museums which I have taken from my bed in Palo Alto during the past year which I would like to share with you now. Our first brief stop is the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley, where you can see Mantvis and I posed in front of one of the world's first mechanical computers. Mantvis is a quadriplegic who joined me from his home in Lithuania. He also operates the road nut with his head. In fact quite a few other quadriplegics, often from other continents, have participated. Next, we will hop over to the National Museum of Australia in Canberra, near Sydney, where the Government of Australia has built a pair of robots to make their National Museum accessible to school classes across the continent. 
Although the teleprisoned robots are actually driven in this case by the tour guides, remote visitors are able to control the pan and tilt of a telescopic camera, and interact with other visitors as well as the guide, so it is still very much like being there. It is online now. Since there's no jet lag with telepresence, let's pop over to South Dakota to visit the National Museum of Music. Like me, you may not have realized it was in South Dakota, but it is arguably the finest collection of historical musical instruments in the world. When using beams, we were literally able to wander freely around the museum, using our head movements to drive. We were able to talk to the tour guide, learn about the exhibits, and listen to some demonstrations. This is some film of me in the National Music Museum in South Dakota listening to Dr. Cleveland Johnson play an ancient pipe organ. Let's listen in as Dr. Johnson also plays a centuries-old precursor to the piano, complete with a percussion pedal. From South Dakota we beam into the Smithsonian Museum for Native American Culture, where we are again greeted by song. I want to share a song with you, Henry. And given a brief history lesson. Uh, the woman up front, her name is Polly Cooper. She was an important uh, leader at this time. Uh, as with uh, the man on uh, the right there, his name was Oskin. That presentation concluded our tour of the American Indian Museum, which was remarkable in many ways. I figured that as long as we were in Washington, D.C. visiting Smithsonian's, we might as well pay a visit to my childhood favorite, the Air and Space Museum, pictured here in front of the Capitol. Let's peek in on the beginning of our tour. Uh, be able to bring the Smithsonian all the way across the country and uh, have your input as well. So. Uh, so we're going to walk around, we're going to start um, start at the beginning as they say, we're going to start with the Wright Brothers, and uh, of course just feel free to interrupt with any questions uh, that you have along the way. We had a wonderful tour, seeing giant rocket engines and taking the obligatory photograph with our tour guide in front of the lunar landing mural. But besides looking at various historically significant rockets and airplanes, we also experienced some of the social aspects of the beam. The museum was crowded that day, and we were mobbed by curious onlookers like these enthusiastic school children. After the Air and Space Museum, we visited the nearby Kennedy Center and attended the National Symphony Orchestra. This time we met some friends, the Gallagher's, with whom we had a nice visit before the performance. Since the powers that be would not let us film the actual orchestra playing, what you see here is a tour they gave us of the orchestra's stage earlier in the day. I saw the magnificent pipe organ with the choir stand and the wonderful harp. They even let me stand next to the conductor's podium and gaze out into the concert hall. They pointed out President Obama's suite which was right in the center rear. The social aspects of the bean can't be overestimated. As we were mingling with the crowd prior to the performance, we bumped into John F. Kennedy's nephew, Tim Shriver. Tim introduced himself and invited us to say a few words at his upcoming book signing in California, which we did. Famous museums in San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Chicago, London, England, New York, St. Petersburg, and Paris have expressed an interest in installing remote presence devices. No museum tour would be complete without a visit to the St. Louis Art Museum with my parents and sister's family. Please join us. Giving his giving his uh, best shot. 
and now on to another gallery. This time the camera is attached to the top of the beam, so you see what I see. So this is a Norman Rockwell painting called Thanks You Pay. It was painted in 1943 and it was a cover of a Saturday Evening Post. But it's an image of an Italian girl, a young Italian girl, and there's an American GI who's given her his jacket and his rations, and that's what she's eating, and she's giving her Thanksgiving for it. And so this is also the other side of, of World War II. This is While we were in St. Louis, we took the opportunity to visit our daughter Michaela at Washington University. We got a chance to warm up by the fire, and then to catch up with Michaela and her friends. We got to meet everybody, and learned all about what was going on on campus. We noticed that everybody had on heavy winter coats and wondered why. So they let us down a narrow corridor, passed a bunch of shivering students, and gave us a quick tour outside. We have a lot of our classes just in the building right here. Um, yeah, this is the lab. That'd be perfect. <laughs> Ironically, as soon as we beamed out of snowy St. Louis, our son Mike beamed in from sunny Southern California, where he is a freshman at UCLA. Hi, Mikey! Hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? Been busy. Tell you what was going on in the life and times. Um... Now, wheeled robots are great, but they must be on a smooth surface. If the bedridden person wants to join their family on a picnic, they need something else. The second type of device sits on the shoulder of someone you want to remotely visit. Hence the name Polly. And swivels around in many directions under remote control by the user. It can be used by the bedridden to accompany and converse with friends and family on excursions. You hear what they hear and see what they see. Let's watch. We'll start okay. walking and you tell us what you where you want to go and stop. Next, let's briefly look at three more types of telepresence prototypes that may soon greatly expand the worlds of bedridden people. We've already discussed two types of land-based telepresence devices. But as we gaze at our planet, we see that there is much more to explore. Consider the white film that surrounds the Earth, which is our atmosphere. To explore this remotely requires drones. Since our last TED Talk focused heavily on drones, today I'll just update you on our recent progress. After Dr. Jenkins posted his long-distance remote control drone software on the web, a group in Australia successfully downloaded it so I was able to chase my host around the stage after my speech near Sydney from my bed in California. Let's watch. Come on. One more time. <laughs> All right, and give me a clap, everybody. In a separate drone project, Georgia Tech vastly improved the code to fly a drone with the Oculus Rift virtual reality headset, so that I can fly around my yard, as shown here, steering with my head. This code is also open source. That is, free for everyone. One drawback of live drones, however, is they require ground crews. Luckily, I was recently made aware of a website, travelbydrone.com, that allows you to select from over 5,000 drone videos from around the world anytime you want. Perfect for the tele-tourist. In fact, let's pop in on Azerbaijan via drone right now. Wait a minute. 
Didn't I just say we could go anywhere we wanted in the whole world? What are we waiting for? Let's take our drone to the Four Seasons in Bora Bora. For the fourth means of tele tourism, let's take another look at our planet. As we all know, water covers most of the Earth. So what would the teletourist do without a web-controlled submarine? Luckily, I found one in Berkeley, California, and piloted it around to test the tank while I was lying in bed in Palo Alto. Open water is next. For the fifth and final form of teletourism, let's return to a view of the Earth. We have covered land, sea and air, so what is left? Why, space, of course. And the International Space Station. I recently happened upon this article, which announces that a research team is trying to enable browser control of the robot on the space station by anyone with a PC. Provided you can get NASA's approval, that is. Since a round-trip ticket on the Russian Soyuz currently costs $70 million, it is no wonder NASA is looking at telepresence. I have not funnabled my way into a visit yet, but don't bet against me. Some people have even suggested that telepresence is the new standard for accessibility, and should be mandated for all public buildings. So if you know any elderly or bedridden people, tell them that soon they won't be able to travel the world anytime they want. In fact, some museum robots are available now. Please join us in making the whole world accessible once again to bedridden, elderly and underprivileged people with this exciting new technology. Help us spread the word. Thank you.